Tervetuloa. Mä sanon muutaman sanan tässä aluksi suomeksi. Hyvää iltaa ja, ja hei kaikille. Mun nimi on Jarkko Rikkilä ja työskentelen Tampereen kaupunkikirjastossa koordinaattorina. Tänä iltana ja tässä striimissä täällä pääkirjasto Metsossa me saadaan vieraaksi suoraan Yhdysvalloista huippukitaristi, artisti, taiteilija, kirjailija Mark Ribot. Ja tämäkin vierailu ajateltiin toteuttaa ensin tämän vuoden tammikuussa. Koronarajoitukset kuitenkin iski aika vahvasti päälle tuolloin, ja, ja nyt meillä on viimein mahdollisuus saada tämä toteutettua täällä ja, ja tänään. Pääsemme kokemaan nämä tapahtumat tietysti täällä live-tilassa Metsossa, mutta myös striimin välityksellä, joten tervetuloa myös mukaan siellä linjoiden toisessa päässä olevat. Vaihdetaan ajatuksia, ja englantia kohta puhutaan kielenä, mutta haluan tosi isosti kiittää tässä alussa G Live Lab. Mestaa Tampereelta ja erityisesti Jaani Haapasalo, jonka, jonka sinnikkyys sai tämänkin tapahtuma järjestymään. Ja kirjastolle nämä yhteistyöt ovat todella tärkeitä asiakkaiden kannalta. Sisällöstä puhuminen lisää kulttuurin ja sivistyksen arvoa. Ja Mark Ribot aloittaa keikan G Live Labissa, siis 19.30. Käsittääkseni lippuja on vielä jonkin verran jäljellä, joten jos teillä ei ole omaa lippua, niin, niin tota, ottakaa se haltuun viimeistään nyt. Ja nyt vaihdetaan kieli englanniksi. Uh, Let me welcome uh, guitar player Mark Ribot. Let's give an applause to Mark. <laughs> We're so pleased and blessed to have you here. Uh, you're a world famous guitarist. And for me, this interview is, you know, it re represents many things. I'm a big fan of guitars, as you can see maybe <laughs> from the stage. <laughs> Uh, also, I'm a big fan of your, your music and, and your kind of playing style. Uh, and I'm also a librarian, so, so our main job is to, to talk about music and, and talk about books. Um, I remember Elvis Costello once said that uh, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Um, maybe you can, you know, explain what it means to me, but uh, I think we have a good discussion ahead of us. Um, It's good that we have the opportunity to have the library also available virtually via the streaming uh, on the internet. So today we are focusing um, mainly on, on Mark's book, uh, Unstrung Rants and Stories of a Noise Guitarist. Um, I think this book is truly amazing. Uh, it consists of four different parts where you speak uh, about yourself as a guitar player, about the history of, of your guitarism as, as a musician, as a writer, as a human being. And for me, the book also represents uh, the study of music in a way, because uh, some of the chapters are like musicology almost, uh, where there, you, know, you, you reflect the experiences of playing in various combinations, bands or musical groups. Um, but first of all, um, when was the last time you visited library, and what does the uh, public library mean to you? Um, well, yeah. well um, <laughs> I read a lot of books, but I'm very lazy about going to the library, which is, I'm, I don't say that with pride, you know, but um, uh, so it's probably been a while since I've visited a public library. Yeah, that's a good answer. Books, <laughs> books, however, mean a lot to me. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I wrote one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the book's first chapter, you say that the guitar is the essential instrument of blues. Maybe that's why Picasso in his blue period works also represents the guitar as a symbol, symbol of sadness or hope. Uh, it depends how you look at it, uh, and you've been working on with many world-famous artists like Elvis Costello and Tom Waits, John Zorn, and your style of playing is versatile and different. Uh, but how is it? Is it different uh, to be on tour on your own than than with a band? Well, when I perform solo, the band's always tight, you know. <laughs> but. Um, And there's fewer people who I have to worry about falling off the train or getting drunk and not showing up, you know, other than myself. So in that sense, it's easier. And, um, you know, one is 
for better and for worse, one is rarely uh, in this digital age truly alone. Um, and so I, I like touring solo. I've done it a long time. Um, and I have to say this, I, I don't want to interrupt your line of questioning. I'm particularly happy to be touring solo in Finland in late November. It's fantastic for me. Um, and I had, you know, especially since I've discovered vitamin D, <laughs> I can truly appreciate and I admire all of you for surviving. And one other thing I'd like to say about it, um, I mean, if, if you reconsider your, uh, uh, the idea of me reading, um, a, a lot of my early music working life took place in Maine, which is in the far north of the United States. And there's a few, there's a few stories in the book that describe that, and I'm, I'm having flashbacks to that from, uh, from this little four-day tour of Finland. Maybe you can share one if you remember. Yeah, just a uh, short. You know, yeah. I, that here, would I'd be like great. to. Yeah. I'd like to share. A, this is just a, a fragment of the story that's called "Oh Say Can You See." Um, when you've driven to the edge of America, as far north as you can go, past Augusta, past Bangor, past Holton, past the fenced-off strategic air command based at Limestone and the last all-night Dunkin' Donuts, up where, quote, the wind blows heavy on the borderline, unquote, and the long winter's wear and tear has made your Kodachrome superfluous months ago. Then you're at the end of America, the border, the limit. But for Canadians, it's just the beginning. And here's what every Canadian, in fact, everyone in the world who's not American, knows about America. It is the land of sex. And that's why you're here, in a hotel bar in Van Buren, Maine, in 1976, standing in a matching wide-collared outfit with the rest of your band, scratching out the chords to The Hustle on a cherry-red 1967 melody maker, while off to the side, on a stage consisting of a dirty rug and plywood thrown over packing crates, the, quote, exotic dancer, unquote, contorts and grovels listlessly while five or six drunk potato farmers aim Canadian nickels at her pussy. They mostly miss, but she's too medicated to care, her, quote, dance, unquote, always threatening to devolve into crawling, twitching, or sleep. Somehow, implausibly, it's afternoon, and what gray light, winter light manages to pass the filthy windows enters an uneasy alliance with the red of the single stage light's cracked gel, an unhealthy blend not flattering to the human form. Every now and then a gust of cold wind and bright light from the exit door strips the last exotic defense from the naked dancers, now only too familiar flesh. In front of you, your lead singer, Kay, goes slightly cross-eyed, trying to puff out a breathy melody on her flute in time to mouth the song's only lyric, Do the Hustle. A year later, Kay would get all banged up trying to make a gig at Fort Kent, which is the last stop on Route 1, which begins in Key West during a blizzard. But today, she and her leaky flute are in fine form. Maybe Kay's equally sturdy French-Canadian girlfriend Donna had come with the band on this run and was sitting in the back drinking heavily and scowling at the potato men. Donna's ancestors had drifted across the border with the lumber trade. There was a derogatory name the Maine Yankees used for these other Acadians, but you've happily forgotten it. Maybe Donna hadn't come after all. Strippers who couldn't make it in New York City went to Boston. Those who couldn't make it in Boston went to Portland. Those who couldn't make it in Portland went to Bangor. Beyond that was the exotic dancer circuit, a stripper's equivalent of the glue factory. A similar map could be drawn for professional musicians. What a story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it fits like, you know, very good into this weather we have here. 
Um, something about the book, uh, you know, from the first part, uh, you mentioned this name, uh, Franz Cassius. Uh, very shortly, I think you have many stories about this um, composer and, and wh what's the meaning of Franz Cassius to you. But, um, you know, could you give us some ideas? Uh, who is Franz Cassius and, and what, you know, have you learned from him? Well, Franz Cassius uh, um, is the late great um, composer and guitarist who um, is considered the master of, of Haitian uh, classical guitar composition and playing. Um, and he was also my guitar teacher, not because I showed any particular aptitude for classical guitar, but because he was a friend of my family's. This was one of these strange New York accidents. Um, uh, okay, how did it happen? My father was a doctor, and he interned at Harlem Hospital. And there was another doctor who was a jazz musician who, anyways, long story, introduced, um, brought my parents to a party where they met Franz and, and other musicians. My aunt was a songwriter. They became, my aunt and uncle became lifelong friends, and my family became lifelong friends with Franz, who had come to New York, um, uh, had come to New York in the, in the um, 1948, uh, I, he had the mission of composing great classic, great Haitian classical guitar music, but he felt he had to get out of Haiti and away, maybe, maybe a little bit away from his own family, um, in order to do that. I don't think they were very happy with him for dropping out of law school in Port-au-Prince to become a classical guitarist. So, anyways, so I knew Franz because he was a, f a friend of the family. He would show up at uh, family dinners, um, Thanksgiving, Passover, whatever. Uh, and um, he, would off he must have been bored because he would often bring his guitar and play. So that's probably the first live music I heard um, was Franz would sit off and, and play his, his pieces he was working on. And, and so from the age of six or seven on, I would listen to him. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think we could talk something about uh, Susana Baka Ensemble because, you know, um, there's great stories in the book. Uh, for, for example, in the chapter World Music, Time yeah, and yeah. Money, yeah, uh, yeah. where you speak so precisely about the meanings of music and the importance of knowing the different ways of doing and hearing music. Uh, and there's one part uh, I remember which is very interesting. Um, in, the, in the part you, you, you're, you're kind of uh, discussing the meaning of one in improvising. Where's one and where's two? <laughs> you yeah. know, the beats. Uh, and, and this was, uh, I, I studied ethnomusicology in the Tampere University university and and we were studying these things you know all the time and and this book you know it, it could have been an exercise book you know in in the university almost so so um, how do you see the importance of of knowing different musical cultures uh, or styles you know in in playing well I think that I mean I think it's important to listen to and and if you're a musician, learn to play what you like. At the same time, it, you have to take account of the history of colonialism, um, of who you are in relation to that culture beyond its yeah. beyond its sound. How you how you came to what you're going to do with your knowledge. How you came by that knowledge. How you have to make a conscious effort not to replicate a history of colonialism in terms of the sound. And so with um, and what I noticed very early on is that, um, well, OK, for example, um, I, I mean, I love Susanna Baca's music. She, for those who haven't heard it, 
She's um, one of the, the greats of Afro-Peruvian music. Um, and um, I mean, most people know Peruvian music, Inca mu music with this kind of flute-like instrument, yeah. very simple. But Afro-Peruvian music is extremely funky. Um, I mean, if even I'd been through some training with Cuban music, self-training really, but um, you know, I'd, I'd finally managed to understand what what tumbao rhythms to to stop expecting the bass player to play on the yeah. one, you know. Um, but this was a real stretch for me. Festejo rhythms um, were really problematical. And okay, what I mean by that is they they have different sets of expectations. So like, for example, if, if you go to a, I don't know, if you hear dun, 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 like you hear dun is going to be the one, like you know where the one is. But if you hear a festejo rhythm, it's that, 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 that. So but you're not hearing it without my knee slapping, so you're not going to know really where the other musicians are hearing it, uh, unless you've done a lot of that. So, um, so yeah, 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 that's a you know that's a great great story. And uh, well, well yeah. but just to to put a little more on there, you know what I noticed was now how did why of all people did they call me to play on that record? You know, on Susanna's first record. Uh, well, it was David Byrne's record company, and uh, you know, I think he want. It wasn't because I could play Festejo better than the worst guitarist in Peru, um, but it, obviously he want. I think they wanted to increase, you know, the to increase the market for Susanna's music, um, or something like that, or get different sounds on it. And so, but I noticed that. You know, when we toured and, and the publicity for the record, that it was being presented as this thing of, oh, isn't it beautiful? Music is a common language. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, well, music, like the, the, idea, um, the idea that this was a common language, I mean, there is no more basic form of language than knowing where the... No, no, nothing more basic to musical syntax than knowing where the one is. To, to, uh, to get the comparison I think I give in the book is that it's like if you shift your finger, <laughs> if you don't know where the one is, it's like shifting your fingers one key over on the typewriter and then typing your memoir. You know, <laughs> nobody's going to understand it. You know, um, or few people, anyways. Uh, and so. I, I noticed that there was a contrast because I was going around making all kinds of music that sounded like disjointed um, nonsense with other musicians downtown, and yet we had, and also other free jazz musicians and improvisers that came out of different, impro you know, improvising schools around downtown music, free jazz, um, post cajun improvising, and it was. In fact, we had a huge common language. We had, you know, that had been worked for and fought for over the years. And uh, so th that was being portrayed as complete chaos. And this was being, when it wasn't, and this was being portrayed as a uh, one happy big family of music. Yeah. What? So I believe the, uh, the, the experiences, for example, Susanna Bagas uh, with, with, with her ensemble is is that it has influenced very much on your playing style, you know, on also on on your improvisation kind of style. Or what do you think? The Susanna Baca's music yeah, in yeah, particular. Yeah. Um, well, I've done my best to uh -huh. learn to play festejo a little better over the years, but I don't think Susanna yeah. Baca's music in particular. I wouldn't say. I would say that um, I, I had a longer engagement with Cuban music and. Yeah. The music of yeah. Arsenio Rodriguez, yeah. and I was kind of meaning the uh, the the what, what you told about the uh, improvisation about the one and two, but let, let's move to to the improvisation improvisation part because uh, one of one of the themes uh, that combine your artistic work with this book, uh, I think it structures um, you know 
it, it deals with improvisation. Uh, and uh, could you tell us something about uh, Derek Bailey? What kind of influence he has been to you? Well, Derek Bailey is, a, is considered the founder of free improvisation, which is um, not to be confused. Well, it was in, in a way, was a response to free jazz. Uh, in a way, it was a political response to free jazz because Derek and other musicians, late 60s, early 70s, were sensitive to critiques that they were um, uh, kind of appropriating black American music. A lot of, you know, they were, Derek was English musician who, by the way, was a very good jazz musician and studio musician. Um, and so, um, so instead of, free jazz is also itself a misnomer uh, because people presume um, that it means, well, sometimes it does mean just blow your head off and do whatever you want. Um, that's always fun, but generally what it meant was free of the compositional constraints of bebop and earlier forms of jazz. So in fact, each one of the great free jazz compo composers and band leaders invented a new new systems and new, I'm talking about Ornette Coleman, Albert Eiler, and late John Coltrane, and you know um, yeah. uh, others in, in that scene, invented their own Im improvising systems. But um, uh, Derek's contribution was to say that each improvisation should be completely without history, sui generis, starting from a blank slate and no presumptions about music whatsoever, which in time generated its own series of cliches because it turns out that usually what comes out of the yeah. improvisational uh, machine is generally uh, consists of somewhat of, oh, this is a, not the best, nicest metaphor, but partially digested pieces of whatever went into it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good, Good one. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, and the book, uh, Armstrong, Rants and Stories of a Noise Guitarist, also, th there's this uh, fictional part also in this book. Uh, and you mentioned you, you know, although you mentioned you haven't been into the library, maybe, lately, uh, or, or uh, you know, it, it's, it's been a long time. But you read a lot of books. Um, so, so, what are your kind of uh, inspirational authors? You know, uh, what authors have ha have been an inspiration to you when you write your own stuff? Um, well, uh, uh, I'm a fan of the work of Lynn Tillman, yeah. and um, there was a, um, there's a, a Russian writer. Um, uh, Daniel Harms? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, but, but I have to say that <laughs> I have to say that I wrote, you know, like that was uh, after the fact discovery. I, I yeah. discovered his stuff, but totally by accident in a bookstore about uh, twelve years ago. After I'd written a large amount, and I th amount a large number of these stories. So, um, uh, yeah, but I, I feel a lot of. Uh, um, Italos, I, I feel a lot for Car K. Harms. How's it yeah, pronounced? Yeah, yeah. Work. Um, you know, it was sobering to realize that the author I felt the most kinship with died of starvation in a in a Soviet mental institution. I hope that doesn't foreshadow my own future. But um, Italos Fevo. A lot of the other middle, middle European writers I like. Oh, I wouldn't. Uh, oh, it's all the way down there. I'm not going to get it. But fabulous new book by a, a, a good friend of mine, Jenny Quilter, called okay. Hatching, okay. which describes and kind of dissects her experience with in vitro fertilization. Yeah, thank you for sharing these uh, book tips. You know, from. Lots of ranges. 
Um, I want to talk about the uh, resistance and activism part because there's a section uh, in your web page that's titled activism. Um, and you also, yeah. I've never visited my web page. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that's part of my activism. <laughs> But it's good that I have visited your web page. So, uh, but there's also in 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 the Songs of Resistance album, uh, there's this this very good linear notes, which is also you know in this book, um, and the linear notes you know it it starts like this: My grandparents lost brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, and uncles in the Holocaust. And I've toured and have friends in Russia and Turkey. We recognize the likes of Donald Trump, and it's no mystery we, where we will wind up if we don't push back the ideology that created him. Uh, so it's while you wrote this, for example, but, but, but now, for example, Putin is having his war in Ukraine, you know, uh, and Elon Musk welcomes Trump into Twitter again. And the extreme right parties are waiting over Europe also. So what do you think of this all? I think it sucks. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> uh, what, what kind of value the culture uh, could have? Could we make a difference with music? Well, look, that's rec recording songs of resistance was, I was unapologetic agitprop. In other words, it was made part, you know, it's a, just a direct political statement that I felt was necessary to make at, at that time. Um, and, and also partly because I was depressed because, I don't know how it is in Finland, but in America, nobody knows any, there's no common uh, Songs like in, in Italy, everybody sings Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao. You know, like there's in different places they have uh, uh, the resistance movements or protest movements have songs that everybody knows. Whereas in the United States on demonstrations, they just chant the same sentence over and over again, and it's so boring. So I was hoping that some people would learn some songs so that at least we could go for a verse or two. Um, that said, you know, like I think that um, the the most important most important um, the the biggest important of music is not uh, the, its products. Yeah. I mo first of all, I, I, I if you tell me that it has a section called activism on my web page, I I'll have to believe you. But I I don't almost don't like that word um, activism. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a great yeah. essay by Astra Taylor. Uh, called Against Activism, mm -hmm. uh, in which he points out that in the past people didn't used to be so proud just of being active. They used to they used to identify as organizers, organizers, because I mean, in other words, you own and as an organizer, you only get points if you win. You don't you don't just get points. You, people don't pat you on the head for just flailing about and you know you doing the wrong thing can actually hurt. Being active, if you do the wrong thing, is bad. Uh, so um, I think that the most Im interesting thing to me politically about music is not what musicians necessarily say. I mean, why should I know any more about the political situation than anybody in this room? And um, I don't want to be harsh on my fellow musicians, but we often don't. So, um, but it's very interesting what musicians are and how we work. And, you know, I started to notice, um, I mean, look, everybody else in my generation came, I, well, it's very interesting to be here for, for another reason in Finland. Um, everybody in my generation, all the indie musicians came up thinking, well, the union is a joke. Yeah. And, I came from the same scene, but I started to read history and I started to question, well, exactly why? You know, uh, exactly why? I said, well, you know, we, for, for 
the people of some of my generation and, and later generations, the political act was to found your own record company and be independent um, and you know, be independent of, of big business and create an alternative. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was as if, I don't know, it was as if capitalism is some kind of lifestyle choice where you go to the other store and you buy the indie lifestyle and, and then you solve the whole problem. And nobody noticed that, uh, or very few people said, well, gosh, creating a new, sy creating a new system in which um, only people who have the money to pay for their own recordings, uh, that's, why is that progressive? <laughs> you know, uh, exactly why is that the way forward? Why, why is having to pay for all this stuff yourself called independence? It's certainly not independence for people who don't have the money. And so many, anyways, many years later, I, I, so I became involved in um, attempting to, to do some kind of, create some kind of union for independent musicians. And, and part of the, that has involved, to, I'm happy to say that the situation in Finland is much different and, and, and much better. And the club I'll be playing in tonight was, in fact, financed, I believe, by the... Yeah. By the Finnish musician yeah. union, so and the uh, the club you're playing tonight was actually a library before, so right, you know, it has a yeah. very, you know, multiple history <laughs> behind it. Yeah, uh, and talking about the indie, uh, this is a great book by uh, Jim Jarmusch. Oh yeah, uh, music, words, and noise, uh, where there's a chapter where you speak about what's independent or. Oh, you know, yeah. What do we mean by indie, you know, in general? So, so you should, you know, read this book. It's a good book. Uh, but yeah, uh, we are running out of time almost. So, so maybe we could uh, take some highlights from from your discography. It's 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 you know it's almost impossible to raise up some selections from from the collection because. You know, you're played so with with so many uh, brilliant artists, but um, I have to raise up Tom Waits be because uh, I think this album, which is I have the sheet music version now, Mule Variations. Oh yeah, it's it's one of the <laughs> best uh, and one of my favorites. But could you tell us something about the uh, kind of? Shortly, uh, what what was it like to to work with this album, and what what's it like to work with Tom Waits? Well, that album, I came in mostly for overdubs on that one, yeah. and it was recorded in a former uh, chicken house. Okay, <laughs> yeah, a chicken barn formerly, and you could sort of they hadn't cleaned it out perfectly, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it sounded very good, anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and generally it's it's uh, it's great to work with Waits because you know people know he, people know these artists as people know him as a, as an artist, but he's also a record producer. I mean, he's the one yeah. who sits there and tells people what to do in the studio. So he has a very um, uh, light touch in in terms of he tries to set a, a vibe or a mood. Um, uh, with his own guitar playing, or maybe he'll play percussion, or the wo words of the song sets a kind of almost a theatrical concept, and then we come up with ideas inside that. And if he doesn't like them, you know, eventually he'll say, "Well, try something else." But, um, but yeah, within that context, we're free to do do our thing, and so it's a, it's a good collaboration. Yeah, uh, and another one. It's uh, Medeski Martin and Wood, which was one of, one of my favorites when I was uh, growing up uh, in my early 20s, uh, you know, past 20s. Um, and the grooves in, for example, this album, it's, it's so kind of New York. When I was growing up in a small town in, in, in Finland, <laughs> I remember the, 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 uh, the grooves in, in this album. But what, what's it working with uh, these kind of groovy beats? Uh, with this album, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, you know, simply. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and one 
another, uh, I think you played also with this album, with Jacob Dylan. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, yes. Yeah. Uh, how's it, you know, <laughs> do you remember it? Well, I play on a lot of records. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. yeah. Proud. But this is one of my favorites also, and, 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 and uh, it's produced by T-Bone Burnett, which is, you know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, very, you know, you have been working uh, lots of T-Bone Burnett. But, uh, you know, what is working with uh, the, these kind of, kind of uh, alternative bands uh, and, and what's your, you know, has the playing style evolved in some, some ways when, uh, when working with these kind of bands? Has my playing style? Yeah, you know, it's, is, it, is it different than... than well, I've been any, doing it since yeah. I've been yeah, 16 yeah, yeah. So, or 14, <laughs> so I hope it's evolved. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and w one of my favorites is, is Ceramic Dog, uh, kind of your new band. Uh, but this, you know, this album is, is, is you know, this is amazing. Uh, and I have been, you know, listening this all over again. Uh, and it, this, is, this is crazy. Uh, I mean, for example, the, uh, there's a song called Activist in this album. The Activist. The yeah. Activist, yeah. Um, but what kind of band is Ceramic Dog? Um, well, we're a rock band, yeah. And uh, but we have like improvising, sp a lot of improvising space, and uh, I don't know. We just do whatever we want. Oh, I don't know if people can show people the cover because yeah. the, the, what you can so see if people see the covers, there's it's a black cover with a tiny kind of hazy planet Earth in the middle. And the thing is, the, the title of that record was Hope or something like yeah, that, right? Yeah, it's Hope. But the original title, we had the same cover, um, the, but the original title was uh, Better Luck Next Time. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, then, you know, then uh, Biden won the election and they discovered, a, you know, like a, the vaccine was discovered. So I, we didn't want to bump people out anymore. <laughs> so we, we changed the... We changed the title, but it's still the same cover. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, this is, um, I mean, this is so amazing album. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost uh, a perfect album. Uh, for example, this Wana uh, song called Wana. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's great. It reminds me of, you know, almost like Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop or something. Whoa. You know, that's, that, that's... That this is very great, um, but yeah, we're gonna move on uh, to talk about the future. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, for visiting us here. Uh, thank you. And uh, at the end of the interview, I would like to you to tell us uh, what are you going to do next? You know, uh, besides playing here tonight, but you know, like a ten-year perspective. What are your goals or aims? Do you have any? Or whoa. Ten years. Is it a, is <laughs> <laughs> um, well, maybe one year. You know. Okay, one year. That yeah. seems more realistic. Um, I'm, I'm, I have all these. <laughs> I have all most of most of my music has been instrumental. Well, Ceramic Dog is an exception, but most of the rest has been instrumental. But I actually have these, like, um, I have all these demos that I've made over the last twenty five years. Um, and you know, in the beginning, I thought, okay, yeah, I got to do this, write these tunes, and then get some rock star to cover them, you know. And then eventually, I started to listen to what I was recording, and I realized nobody's ever going to cover these <laughs> things. And so I started to try to shop it myself, and I sent them to um, a friend of mine at at a record company. Well, okay, uh, Epitaph Records, who had. Anti-epitaph and put out weights of stuff, so I I knew them and and um, this is a while ago, back when one sent physical objects, you know, of the demos, and I said so. Uh, I called I called him up after a decent interval, and I said so. Did you get my demo? He said, Oh yeah, yeah. I said, What? Well, did you listen to it? Oh yes, yes. Uh, did you like it? Yes, yes, very much. And I said so. Uh, are you going to give me a record deal? 
He says, well, we think that your demos are a little too dark for epitaph. <laughs> And so that's, anyway, so now I'm trying to put them out again <laughs> un under the name of Too Dark for Epitaph. <laughs> so that's, that's my plan for the next year. Sounds like a great plan. Um, so, uh, Mark Rebot, thank you for visiting. visiting Thanks for library. having me. And you're... I'm going to be today uh, in G Live Lab in in 7:30 p.m. That's the uh, the show time. So 7:30 p.m. Yeah, that's right. So be there. And thanks for uh, being here. And thanks for having, yeah, being here. Bye bye. Yeah.